right, well, good morning, everybody. Man, it's been a few weeks, and it, I'm so glad to be back in here in this room worshiping with you guys. How about y'all? What do you think? You excited? Okay. Well, why don't you guys stand up and welcome somebody that you hadn't said hello to, and uh, we'll get started singing together and worshiping the Lord here in just a couple minutes. I want to. I'm going to pray for us real quick as we begin to sing. We begin to worship this morning. Father, I love you so much, and I'm just excited to be here um, with my brothers and sisters. God, as we just sing and worship you and lift up your name, God, I just pray that you would move, Lord, send your Spirit to move and dwell among us, God. Lord, I just pray that we'd feel your tangible presence as we lift up praise today. Lord, we just want to move at your word. We want to follow your spirit, follow your leading this morning as we sing, God. So just have your way. my good that you make 
all things work together for my good. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You make all things work together for my good. Oh, you make all things work together for my good. Yes, you do. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. And when you in the night, the joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know. You make, Cause you make all things work together for my good. Yeah, you make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. I don't have to understand. You make all things work together for my good. Let's give the Lord some praise this morning. Jesus, we love you. We thank you that everything you do is for our good and for your glory, God, and for your name. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making me new wine in the soil I now surrender. You are breaking new ground, so I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I
next song that we're fixing to sing is a new one that we introduced a few weeks ago. And it's just a beautiful song that says that we don't have to worry about anything. And that before we were formed, before we were created, that the Lord knew us and He had plans for us. And all we have to do is just walk in obedience. And He'll show us the way. He'll show us His will for our lives. It's, it's a song called Canvas and Clay. It says, you make all things work together for my future and my good. You make all things work together for your glory and your name. In my mother's womb, you formed me with your hands, known and loved by you. Before I took a breath, when I doubted, Lord, remind me, I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a part of the canvas and the clay. You make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for your name. a healing light just beyond the clouds though I've walked through fire I see clearly now I know nothing has been wasted no failure or mistake you're an artist and the part I'm a canvas in the you make all things together for my future and for my good you make all things work together for your glory Lord and for your name you make all things work Thank you. 
You're an artist at the potter on the canvas and the clay. You're an artist at the potter on the canvas and the clay. You're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. Lord, right now I just renew to you that I trust you. God, in the times that I've doubted, even recently, Lord, that you have everything perfectly knit together for my life. And I know for everyone here in this room as well. Or that you have every step ordered and you have long before I ever breathe my first breath, Lord. I renew my trust to you that you're I know that your ways are better than my ways, God. Your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And I trust you. And that song today is a declaration for all of us. That all we have to do is walk in obedience, and that's where we'll see the miracles. That's where we'll see the outpouring of the Spirit, is just simple obedience. Let's sing that chorus again together. So you make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory. thank you so much that your spirit's here and I just pray that you continue to have your way continue to move in our lives God continue to move on our hearts show us more of who you are today Lord I love you so much Father and it's in your name that I pray Amen alright y'all can have a seat this morning and uh, kindergarten through second grade we'll go with Miss Jaden and at this time we'll have our scripture reading reading today is from Lamentations chapter 3 verses 21 through 26. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. <clears throat> because the Lord's great love we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself the Lord is my portion therefore <clears throat> I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope whose hope is in him to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Morning. How's, ooh, that's loud. How's everybody? Y'all doing good? Y'all look good. So this morning... Um, we all come from different places in life, and uh, we all come from different, like, things that we're going through. Uh, and so what we're going to kind of look at this morning, uh, I think, is something that we all kind of deal with. And as we've, we're, we're going through the Bible, uh, and over the last couple weeks, you know, we've, we've been going through Job, we've gone through uh, Ecclesiastes, and we've gone through, like, the Proverbs, and we've gone through Psalms. And all of these books, I really love them because they all kind of deal with, like, real human emotion. Do, do y'all relate to sometimes when you like read the Bible, there are certain parts where you're like, I really don't get this. I don't relate to this at all. Like, do any of y'all feel that? Are y'all all great? Okay, so like for me, when I read it, like there are a lot of times where I'll read the Bible and I'm like, I have no idea. This doesn't relate to me in any way. But these portions of the scriptures, like Ecclesiastes uh, and Lamentations, which we're going to look at today, I read those and I'm like, okay, I can kind of get behind this. I relate to some of these words. Like, I feel these things at times. So what I want to do today is we're going to look at Lamentations, but before we kind of get to that, uh, I want to talk about chaos. How many of you would, like, agree that life is kind of chaotic at times? Like, would you all agree with this statement? Life is chaotic. Y'all all agree with that? Okay. So as I was thinking about this, I was trying to think, like, how, and I just Googled it. I didn't come up with this definition, but, like, how is chaos uh, defined? Chaos is defined as complete disorder and confusion. How many of you feel like your life feels like that sometimes? Complete disorder and confusion. What's I like? A lot of the old kids are raising your hands. No, I'm just playing. So, uh, so it feels like that at times. And I think that 
this can be defined for like life in general, like just li- everyday life. But I think it also can be defined like define like when there are situations that happen and it seems chaotic. When things we see happen that are not right seem chaotic. So like when there is disorder, when when bad things happen, it's chaotic. When like things that don't make sense happen, it's chaotic. When we see like injustice in the world around us, it seems chaotic because it's confusing, confusing, and it's disorderly. See, for me, like when I think about like if I were God, if I were running the world, right, I would try and make sure everything is how it needed to be, right? How many of you would say like why? You ask the question like why are things the way that they are? And I ask that question a lot. And I think we will all embrace moments of chaos and suffering, right? So we will all embrace those moments. Like we'll we'll have those moments where like we come face-to-face with those situations and those questions where we ask, why is it like that, or why is this happening to me, or we will observe moments of chaos and suffering. Uh, And so, like, if you have, I want to ask a question, and and I'm going to kind of try and ask questions for you to think about this morning, uh, and questions for you to kind of, like, wrestle with, because I think it's important for us as we follow Jesus to think about how we respond to that statement that we all agreed with, like, life is chaotic, and in the midst of that chaos, there are things that don't make sense, there are things that a lot of times kind of hurt, and there are things that we see that hurt, and there are, th- there are things that we go through and we deal with that are not fun, and there is a way to respond to those things, and if you have already embraced these moments, what was your response? Like, moments of chaos, just, like, it can be, like, hardship or uh, health issues or just things you see out in the world. Um, like, any time I get on social media, I feel like I see the chaos of the world, right? So how did you respond? Think about for a moment, like, what was your initial, like, gut response, right? So I'm going to tell a story from when, from when I was kind of growing up. So when I was growing up, um, I grew up kind of middle class, and things were pretty, like, comfortable for me. Uh, and around 10th grade, I started playing uh, football, and I was a linebacker. I'm just kidding. I played kicker. So I was the kicker for the football team. And so... When I joined this football team, I went to school um, with a a very diverse group of people. So, like, our school was, like, we had a lot of Hispanics. We had uh, African Americans. We had whites. uh, But for me, up until that point, most of the people that I was around outside of, like, school were, like, people that looked like me, people that were in the same social class as me, people that were, like, living the same kind of lives as I did growing up my whole life. And when I got on the football team, uh, I began to, like, be around, like, guys that were completely different than me. Like, and, and this was because, like, the, the way in which they grew up. So in my town in Cordell, Georgia, there is a railroad track right through the middle of the town. And if you go over to the other side of the railroad track, uh, that's the, the other side of town. And that's what, people, that's what people would say. And this other side of town was a higher population of uh, African Americans and it was a higher population of poverty. Uh, and before I started playing football, I didn't really engage with that side of town. Uh, and so for me, my viewpoint of life was like one way. I only viewed life in one kind of way. And so I started playing like football, and, and what would happen is once I got a car and I was able to drive, my teammates would say, hey, Blake, can you give us a ride home? We don't want to ride the bus. It takes forever to get home from practice. And I was like, sure, whatever. And so I began taking some of these guys home. And what I began to realize as I would take these guys home, I would pull up to these little small houses, and I would begin to think like, you have like six brothers and sisters. Like, are y'all all living there? And I began to realize more and more, like, oh, people aren't living like I'm living. Like, people on this other side of town are living, like, in poverty and in hardship and in situations. They were around things that, like, guys, like, when we were in high school, shouldn't have been around. Like, and so I, I made pretty good friends with one of, uh, one of these guys, and he would, like, even after he graduated, he'd hit me up and ask for rides because he didn't have a car. And I would take him different places. And I remember one time I took him to go get his hair cut, and he got his hair cut uh, by this random guy in this, this run-down house on, on the other side of town. And I remember going into this house, and, like, there was, like, no furniture. It was just, like, two bedrooms, and there was, like, a mattress on the floor, and he had a barbershop chair in, like, in his living room. And, like, the, the, the more I engaged with, like, these kind of situations when I would go to the other side of town, I began to, like, there was this very uncomfortable feeling that I would get. And it was because I began to think, like, it shouldn't be like this. Like, life shouldn't be this way. Like, this seems unjust to me. Why are these people, like, so poor? Why are these people living like this? Why are things, why don't they have the comfortability that I have? Why have I been given comfortability? And so 
I embraced a moment of like the chaos of life, which resulted in for some people poverty. And my, these were my like sometimes my responses. Like it sometimes angers me. Sometimes I do that out of empathy. It makes me sad. There's grief. There's anxiety. There's disappointment. There's fear. There's loneliness. There's all these different I think normal responses to things that we see that do not seem right. Like how many of you can relate? Maybe you've seen something out in the world like whether it be like poverty or injustice or whatever, and you immediately have that response of like, I wish I could do something about that, right? And so that is what we're kind of getting at this morning. And the question that I want to ask is, is there a right or wrong way to respond to the suffering or the injustice of the world around us? Is there a right or wrong way to respond to this? And the book of Lamentations uh, is about a response to hardship. The book of Lamentations is about this response to hardship. And Lamentations is a really interesting book. It's a collection of Hebrew poems that focus on the grief, the pain, and suffering that come out of living in Jerusalem after Babylon eventually captured, plundered, and destroyed it. So what has happened in the Old Testament up to this point is that God's people have been disobedient. God allows the consequences of their disobedience to take place, which eventually what we see in 2 Kings 24.10, it says at the time of at the time the officers of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, advanced on Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And what we find in Lamentations is we find a response to all of this stuff that's going on. And to give kind of a visual, like this is like we read these stories in the Bible, and it's very easy for us to be disconnected from like the humanity and the things that are going on in these stories. But what goes on in the story of Israel being seized by Babylon is death, hardship, famine. And the people that are writing in Lamentations are crying out to God, asking the question of why. Why is life chaotic? Why are things happening? Have you abandoned us, God? And to give you kind of a visual, like we can kind of see this is what I'm sure it looked probably a lot worse than this, but they destroy the temple. They take the things from the temple. They destroy everything that Israel has built at this point. Everything that God has promised them through their covenant with him, they have taken. And Babylon has taken Israel. And what Lamentations reveals is experiences of warfare, siege, famine, and death. And so what we find in Lamentations are these words of people that are wrestling and dealing with that, that question of like, is there a right way to respond to the suffering that I'm going through and the suffering that I see around me? And when we like deal with this, when we read these words, I think these words can speak to us today because I think like for me, when I saw like the other side of town for me, right? Like when I would begin, I, I eventually I found Christ and I began to follow Jesus. I began to like Pray to God, like, why? Like, I would go to God with honesty. We're going we're gonna to get to that. So let's look at Lamentations, uh, Lamentations chapter 3. And an interesting fact about uh, Lamentations, this has not got nothing to do with the sermon, but it's just cool to me. So Lamentations, did any of y'all ever do acrostics in, in literature, right? Anyone do acrostics? Do y'all know what those are? Nobody? Okay, so in Lamentations, every single chapter uh, corresponds to the first line of every single verse starts with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it's just an acrostic. It's a poem. And so it's beautifully done, and it's very intentional because these words are coming from a place of emotion and intentionality to God. So Lamentations 3, 1 through 6. If you're ever on Jeopardy, maybe that'll come up. So I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again, all day long, he has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship, and he has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. Real encouraging words for you this morning, right? So these words are coming from a place of a troubled heart, right? They're coming from a place where, like, they don't know what to do. They've seen everything that's going on. Chapter 1 of Lamentations kind of gives you an outline of all the destruction that's going on. There's all this, like, illustrations and poetry that d describe, like, how Babylon has come in and destroyed everything. And then what we see is in chapter 3, there is this anonymous author, a man that speaks about how he feels, how his heart is responding. And he's asking questions to God, and he's describing how 
he is dealing with it. And let's look at these words again. I just want us to like really like look at like this is pure honesty. And I, I think it's healthy for us to read the Bible and see the honesty of the people that are dealing and wrestling with God. Because I think it's so important for us as we in our spiritual life are honest with God and go to God with who we are, not who we may be pretending to be, but going to him with full honesty. He says, I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He's saying, God, you're the one doing this. Like, well, you're the one that's causing this wrath. God, you have, you have driven me away, and you've made me walk in darkness rather than light, that there is no light in my life right now. All I see is darkness. All I see is hardship. All I see is pain, and I don't understand. Indeed, he says, God, he has turned his hand against me, not just once, but again and again. God, you keep doing this to me all day long. And these verses speak like from a troubled heart, a place of hardship. And in Lamentations, we see this, this honesty. And we see this like outpouring and this outcry, this like hard, these hard emotions and these feelings. We see in Lamentations 3, later on in, in chapter 3, same chapter, Lamentations 3.17, I have been deprived of peace. Have any of you ever felt that way? I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity, I've forgotten what happiness is. I don't understand anything. And so what he's dealing with is things that I think we all deal with, we wrestle with. We all have come to places where we have either dealt with like injustice and suffering and pain up front to, in our own personal lives, or we see it in the world around us, just like this author has, he has dealt with it personally, where his land has been destroyed, his, where he lived has been destroyed, and he's seeing the suffering around him. And for him, there's no hope. For him, there is no, like, peace. And he doesn't know what to do. And have you ever felt, like, these same emotions? Like, have you ever had places in your life where you have felt these emotions where I feel deprived of peace? I've forgotten what happiness is. And if you haven't, and I, Lord, I hope you, you don't have to, but more often than not, like, in life, you will deal with those emotions, those feelings, as though God was against your life. And I, I've had those moments. When I was 16 years old, my parents got divorced. My dad was uh, addicted to, like, all kinds of drugs. He was an alcoholic. I saw things that I should not have been seeing. I was around certain types of people that I should not have been around. And I remember, like, continually feeling these emotions inside of me, and I was always pushing them down. And I felt like I was so angry with God. I was like, God, what? You know, people tell me that you're a loving father. The only kind of father I know is one that's doing horrible stuff. And so I've dealt, like, I personally have dealt with these things. And when we go through these moments, I think it's important for us to grace how we feel. We should embrace how we feel. Just like this author in Lamentations says, we should embrace how we feel. Because I think it's so important to our spiritual formation and our spiritual life as we follow Jesus. In response, we should go before God from a place of honesty. There is a place in our prayer, like for protest, for questions, and even anger. Like in Lamentations, we see like they're not happy. They're dealing with things. They're wrestling with things. When you pray, when you go before God, when you are dealing with your own suffering and you see the suffering of others. Like for me, like when I went to the other side of town and I saw like my friends that were like living in poverty and things that didn't make sense to me, as I became a Christian, I began to go before God and say, why is this like this? What can I do about it? Why, why don't you fix this? And I think that's how we ought to, to pray, in honesty. And Henry Nowant says this, dare to feel your losses, dare to grieve them, Name the pain and say, yes, I feel real pain, real fear, real loss. And I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to deal with it up front. And I think that's important. I think we need to do that. In the journey of faith, we must take time to lament. In our journey of faith, we should not be people that push down our emotions. We should not be people that avoid, like, the pain and the suffering. We should, people that, should be people that see it, and it does something to us, that it draws up empathy, whether it be for other people or dealing with the pain that we personally are going through. But the question that we have to ask is that where do we move towards as we lament, as we're feeling these things? Where, where do we go from there? And I think it's a place of remembrance in our grief. There is a time for grief, and there is a time to, like, deal with that pain and deal with that hardship and deal with that suffering. But there's also, for us as followers of Jesus, a time to remember why we have hope in the midst of that, right? There, there's a time for us to remember it. And what's beautiful about Lamentations 
is we see this like guy that's coming to God with everything that he's got. And then out of nowhere, we see the only words of hope in Lamentations. They're the only words of hope. And it goes like this. Lamentations 3, 21 through 26. And then it's almost like out of nowhere, he goes, wait a second. Yet I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love for me, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail, and they're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, I say to myself. The Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. And the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And one of the most interesting things I see in this situ- this, these verses is, does he ask for the circumstances to change? He doesn't ask for, like, I need you to change what's going on. What does he say? He said, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. And the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I'll wait for him. And the Lord is good to those who hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. His hope is not in circumstances. His hope is not in that life would change. But his hope is simply in his faith to God himself. And the author of Lamentations calls to mind the great love of God. And in the, the Hebrew, he uses a word called hesed. And it's a love that like, comes from commitment. It's a love that's based on commitment. He knows that his God, even in the midst of this, is committed to him, committed to his people. And we see the same thing for us as followers of Jesus, that if we believe in the covenant of Jesus, right, that we have been invited to follow him, that we have been saved by him, that we have the same hope. In the midst of of our grief and lament, can we make room to remember the love of God? In the, in the midst of it, in the very middle of it, and that's what, in Lamentations 3, right in the very middle of all this, this hardship and pain that he's, like, releasing to God, he remembers, I call to mind why I have hope. And this is what I think we should do. I'm trying to be practical. There are two things that I think we should do. We should lament in honesty as we observe the world around us. I think when you go and you pray, when you this week, when, if you take time to pray, honestly, go before God. Like, you don't have to be well-behaved when you pray. You can go before God. He, he already knows what you're thinking anyways. So you might as well reveal it to Him. And we should remember God's commitment to redemption as we lament. God is committed to redeeming our world, and He's already done it. So we are simply invited into participating in that. And that's what Jesus invites us into. He invites us into the kingdom of God right here today participate in that as we lament let us remember how jesus entered into the sufferings of the world jesus entered into this world as it was right he came he lived as a human and what did he do he head-on dealt with like people that were sick people that were broken people that were hurting and he was with them and he entered into this world and he healed their temporary issues and things like that but what we find eventually is that jesus he laments himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes before God and he prays. And he's like, I don't know if I can do this, but if your will be done, do it. And when he's on the cross, he's got God. Why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? And Jesus, like, he is a part of this great redemption for us today. That as we're living and as we're seeking him and as we're following him, that we see those things. Like, for me, when I saw, like, that other side of town, right, like, I was called to, like, love those people. I was call, I'm called to be there for those people. I'm called to do something. If I can do something about that, do something. There's so many great things that we can do in this community to, like, embrace the injustice around us and bring about, like, the redemption of Christ because we have been redeemed, right? And so how can Jesus' resurrection change our perspective on the state of the world? We don't have to live in hopelessness, right? We don't have to live, like, in this midst of just like, I don't know what's going to happen. I have no hope. For, for the person writing in Lamentations, he writes those verses and he writes those statements and he writes these things coming from a place where, that I think we all can relate to. And the question that I think we have to ask ourselves is, what am I, how am I going to respond as we lament? Right? How am I going to respond as I lament and deal with like, these emotions and these things? For those of you this morning that are dealing with like, things in your life are you going to God in like in honesty are you going to God with like what you're truly wrestling with are you being honest with him are you 
telling him how maybe you're angry with him? Are you telling him how I don't really like the way the world is around me? You know, how are you responding? Are you going in honesty? And then when you see the injustice in the world around you that maybe draws up those like emotions and those things that make you ask the question of like, why are things this way? We are invited by Jesus to do something about those things. We are called to, to give to the people that are hurting. We're called to walk alongside the people that are broken. Galatians 6, 2, it literally tells us like to carry the burdens of those that are with us. And for us, like as followers of Jesus, this is what we're called to do. We're called to, one, recognize and, and observe and deal with suffering and lament about it. Be honest with God as we pray and wrestle with that. But then also do something. We are called to participate in the kingdom today. And so this week, when you deal with the suffering, when you pray, when you like, go before God, will you go in honesty? And will you do something about the suffering and the hardships that you see around you? Or will we simply stand by? Because Jesus is calling us, and he is, he's inviting us into that. And I'm going to invite the band to come back up as we move into a time of worship. And, you know, this is a space, church is a space where you can truly be honest with God. We can be honest with each other. We can be like, come, like, this is open for you to pray. Like, there are people in the room that are here that, like, this should be a place of community where we can be with each other and pray for each other and wrestle with suffering together. But we all still must be reminded as we worship and as we pray that hope is not lost. Yet I call to mind why I have hope. All right? So as we move into uh, the last little bit of worship that we have this morning, I want to invite you this morning to, like, Respond in, a, in honesty. Respond in honesty to what God is doing in your heart and what maybe he's drawing up in you this morning. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for your love uh, and your mercy, God. I just pray you would continue to show us what it is you want to change within us. I pray that we would be open to where you're calling us to, where you're, where you're calling us to step into those places where we see in the world where they're suffering and we can do something about it. God, I pray that we would be honest with the moments and the situations that are in our lives with you, that we wouldn't have to act as if we have to be well-behaved when we pray to you, that we could be open and honest in our frustrations. God, I just pray that we would also continue to be reminded that even though in the midst of our lamenting and our grief and our pain, that we do have hope, that our world has been redeemed by Jesus through his death and through his resurrection, and that we have victory this morning. I just pray that we would like be open to what you have called us to do in response to that victory. Jesus, would you move in our hearts this morning? Would you draw us closer to you? Would you draw us towards uh, your kingdom and living it out today? And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as we move into response time and into a time of worship, we have a very special response song sung today by Miss Allie Green here. So she's going to lead us in amazing grace. My chains are gone. And I just want to remind you that the altar is open for prayer also. And the offering basket is up here if you'd like to worship with tithes and offerings at this time also. Let's stand and sing together today. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I found was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear and graced my fear to leave. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood His mercy reigns unending love amazing grace Promise good to me. 
is worth my hope secure with God this week and see see the world around us. Y'all have a great week. God bless. See y'all next week.